Cool, okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, so let's all welcome to the stage James Kapper. Um, you might have seen his agricultural looking robot on the way over to um, the uh, Cybar. He's been running out over the weekend. Uh, I'm really excited to see his talk, I hope you are too. Uh, everybody, uh, James Kapper. Thanks. Um, okay, it is working. I just got. To... You guys, you guys can all hear me. Um, yeah. So I titled this um, talk um, because it's it's a frequent question that gets asked to me, um, and so I I thought I'd go through um, work over the last ten years, starting with with the earliest work. And as I explain, I suppose, the literal, mechanical, conceptual understanding of what I have of my work, um, I'll be able to sort of explain in the, in the evolution of where the work's come from and, and, um, and, and then what it's become. Hopefully, the understanding that I have and, and why these things are in the world from my perspective. So, starting back in... 19, uh, sorry, 19, starting back in 2009, um, 2008, 2009, um, I have this first slide of a sculpture that I call uh, Ripper. And um, the sculpture itself was um, uh, quite, quite a challenging thing to make. And I made it um, on my own in uh, my last year of my BA at Chelsea Art School. And um, the work consists of uh, two uh, jib type structures that you would find in a, a tower crane and um, uses electric winches to uh, mobilize itself um, basically uh, it, it, in, a, in, a, in a rudimentary way it would um, uh, drag itself um, over a, a very flat plane and in the in the in the in 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 what I found in that, in what I discovered, I suppose it was like the Eureka work. It was um, a sculpture that became quite graceful and mobile in its movement, and um, it didn't stay in one place. It didn't stay in one shape, um, and it was very transformative. And any time one would go to see it, it would be in a different position or a different uh, pose. And moving on from that, I sort of started at the same time researching into um, other modes of locomotion. Um, locomotion's always been a very interesting thing for me because I grew up in the countryside um, and then went to art school in London. But from what I learned um, in the country in a rural setting, working with farmers and so on, was that the ground is not always... Um, well, rough, rough terrain is, is quite a critical thing that they have to overcome. And um, my fascination from a young age was watching this, uh, this human um, expedition to try and overcome Mother Nature using um, engineering as a, as, a, as a tool to sort of try and tame things and, uh, and get on with a, with a daily life which um, was always very interesting and always um, changing uh, and exciting uh, from the perspective that they would never know what would happen in a day or what, what, what they would have to overcome. Um, so, so yeah, so through, through working with Ripper and, and, and producing this sculpture, I, I started looking into different methods of locomotion and got very excited in uh, insects and creatures that walk. Um, back in um, back in 2010, I, I built my first hydraulic sculpture. Um, now, I'd always wanted to work with hydraulics, but it was something that I couldn't afford. So it, it sort of was always a dream, and the dreams would sort of manifest in these drawings. Um, and the, draw the drawings would sort of like, in later years, uh, become realities with um, the prototypes. And so this, this is the work I actually have here. Um, it's, it's Mountaineer prototype. It's a, it's a 800 kilo um, 
prototype earth marker. It's part of this division of work which all deals with locomotion um, within terrain. And unlike Ripper, the step I gave myself was um, to sort of get away from these walking machines that we see day to day in, in toys and robots and, and, and tests on YouTube and try and mobilize myself in like extremely rough terrain and try and climb at the same time and see how difficult um, it would be to achieve climbing with, uh, with purely an analog control system. So the, the controls for this, um, for this mobile sculpture are um, basically um, eight four-way joysticks and um, it takes some experience to sort of like learn the actual way of way of walking and I can't say that I've achieved that you know I'm still learning and I think the reason that I went for something of an analog nature in the control system was so that I could learn personally what it is like to walk um, with an anatomy such as the anatomy that it has um, what I found with these um, uh, these legs, and I'll, I keep I keep going back to this leg leg design, is that the telescoping dipper is is actually a really critical part of the leg, and that's not something that um, any animal has within its uh, anatomy. So the anatomy is a mixture of an understanding of what a log lift crane is to, to a femur and a, an, a, in an insect in a grasshopper's leg. So it's kind of like a real mishmash of, of, of different, different ideas being thrown around. Like moving away from the division which deals with earth marking and, and mountaineer, which we can go and see after the talk, I'm going to do a little demonstration of it. But moving on to an, a different division in the work, um, I, what, what I find is within divisions within my research allow me to, um, uh, if, I, if I get stuck somewhere, if I get stuck in earth marking or if I get stuck in something like offshore, um, I, I can move over to a different division to sort of um, get my mind freed again. And in that process, I can also pollinate a lot of the stuff learned in the irate concentration of a single division. So um, within the development of earth markers came teeth. And the, the teeth graduated to a carving division where they became uh, the jaws of a, of a handheld sculpture called a nipper. Um, and this sculpture's um, got a capacity to, to fracture the plaster blocks that it sits on. But that, that I suppose, was, was essentially the, the beginning of the, the defacing of, of, of the idea of foundations or plimps or the architecture that, 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 that we inhabit um, socially or, or, or physically. Um, I had this drawing. Uh, for a very long time and I always start with a drawing and I had this drawing for a very long time and it's called Atlas and um, the, 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 the sculpture itself is like multifaceted so the, 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 the concrete block that the machine sits on also becomes a product of the machine's success in the completion of its installation so the, the, the sculpture itself is is all of it rather than just the concrete block or, or the machine or vice versa. So the, the, the machine consists of the upper car body of, a, of, a, of an excavator with a, an adjusted boom and, um, and obviously a, a set of um, a, 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 a tungsten carbide uh, milling heads for concrete. Now, because the <laughs> excavator itself is quite a heavy thing and it's quite a feat to sort of do it, I sort of downsized around the same time as making Mountaineer, the work that we have here with the telescoping legs that can climb, um, a number of other divisions so that I could prototype things. And Atlas, this is Atlas prototype. It's a similar size to Mountaineer, the work we have here, but it, 
it, it uses a bit more of a, a, a space of a, an installation to work in. Now, the, the functionality of Atlas is that it basically is like the drawing. It, it's bolted into the block um, via a, uh, an armature, which is cast into the cement. And the, uh, the, the, the milling head, the Atlas mill, will then cut into the concrete very slowly. It's a slow moving thing because it's all hydraulics. And that's part of the choreography that I quite like about these, um, these sculptures, these machines, is that they're very slow and they're quite graceful. And it will gracefully, over uh, the period of a show, which may be like a month to two months, um, take its foundations out from underneath itself. Um, in the process of making these works, I also um, developed a number of different cutting heads, which also constitute as, as sculptures. Um, and these, these were all sort of handcrafted in my workshop, where, where much of the, the machines, in fact, all the machines are put together. We, um, and th these were then tested um, in different demonstrations and at different shows. The, the, the legacy of what Atlas has become is now sort of like a, an interesting uh, thing that I've been playing around with, with drawings. Um, and again, going back to drawings, what will happen is that once the prototype's made and a number of demonstrations have been done and I've been able to test it, I'll end up making uh, a number of going back to the drawing board, I suppose, um, is the saying, and coming up with a number of other works. Now these, these works are actually pyramid makers, so they're like the, the opposite of, of Atlas taking its foundations out from underneath itself, underpinning itself. These are actually trying to create something that they can clamber up on top of. So with all of the things that I kind of got together through learning about hydraulics, I suppose, by trial and error and being shouted at by a hydraulic hose fitter, um, I kind of um, managed to sort of get larger ideas sort of together and convince um, funding bodies to help me produce the largest to date, which is uh, Greenhorn. And green, Greenhorn's, Greenhorn's like quite an interesting work because it deals with um, the amalgamation of all of the the understanding of fabrication, hydraulic engineering, and and, and, and free them as a sculptor to sort of like go into an area where um, it's slightly uncharted to sort of try and bring back something that's, that's quite radical. This, this image here is actually um, of the work sort of halfway through its fabrication in the studio. Um, the work now exists down in Chichester um, and it, it, you can see in this, in this image, in this photo, that it, it has it has pretty much all of the things that we've learned about with um, the mobility of, of, of methods of walking propulsion in rough terrain. The, um, the, the flippers allow, um, allow it to ski along through the woods um, and leave very little trace of where it's been. Um, and in the process of doing this, I'm trying to sort of create a, um, a, a forestry style installation that I think at this point the, the concept needs to catch up with me. I need like a place in the world to go with it, to sort of create a film or to create a reason for it. But the point of making it, it was just like a whole jumble of like all of these things I learned and I wanted to sort of try and get them into one piece that could isolate all of that in, 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 um, in, 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 on its own. Now, in, uh, in, in, in understanding on the, the, the other side of things with um, looking at different methods of propulsion, there were like lots of changes through evolution and I sort of look at my practice as if it's, I know in a weird way, going through a similar sort of kind of evolution into the, in, in, it, but from my perspective here, it's sort of into the unknown, so the, the sky's the limit, there's no real ceiling on it. But in this explanation, I suppose, you, you can see where everything has come from in one way or another. Um, this image is actually 
um, explaining uh, different methods of creature locomotion. Um, and it's, it's quite, quite interesting. And I, I isolated quite early on the, um, the mud skipper because I found that this amphibious fish is, is, is quite, quite, quite an interesting creature. It, um, it, it, has, it has an entertaining way of, 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 of getting over very sort of um, muddy plains in, in, in uh, shallow rivers like the Kerala River in India. Um, and it, it's able to breathe out of the water. But its methods of locomotion are really just its front flippers, um, which are also used for its propulsion in water. Um, this, this took me on to a, 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 a dream, in a way, to sort of try and make um, an, a, a work boat for the time being, a nine and a half ton uh, work boat that functions on the Thames in London um, into, into a, 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 a some, somewhat of an amphibious um, sculpture. Um, the, the, the boat is of the name of Dive Co. Free, but will, will, will be changed to, to, to the name Mud Skipper. And um, I, I put these slides in, they're the, they're the newest ones. This, in fact, I took this photo before I came up here. But this is, this is its current state in the yard where I'm working on it. And I suppose this is the project I'm, I've been aiming for in the last 10 years of, of, of all of this research and all of this work. The, the drawings, again, they sort of they state dreams and um, they, they often reflect what's been learned in uh, the experimentation and the demonstration, the expedition of, of works. And um, they sort of, they give me like a freedom like no other. So the, the freedom that one can achieve in drawings is like poetry, you know, you, you you, you may have had a, I may have had a bad day where many things have gone wrong, but I can still sit down and make a drawing of something that fulfills my, my ambitions to look into the future of, of what my work can potentially do and where I can potentially go with it, the journeys I can take. And this takes me to the, the last couple of slides that I'll show, and it's, it's, it's a work which really deals with a journey and after 10 years of like being fixated in like three different divisions of research, I sort of broke away very recently um, with, uh, with the help of, of Verbier, 3D Verbier, which is a um, artist residency in Switzerland, who uh, specifically asked me if I'd give them a proposal for um, a sculpture that could potentially work in a mountain range. Um, the, the project brief was uh, about, a, about a big accident in 1818 where an engineer um, was called into the, 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 the valley um, near the Verbier, near Verbier town to look at a, a, a glacier. And at that point in history, they, they didn't have a huge amount of information on, 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 on glaciers. And it was basically... Um, uh, a, a sort of real stab in the dark for this engineer to try and resolve the, the issue of this ice dam about to break. And um, in the end, they, uh, they, they, they cut a channel through the, 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 the glacier to allow water to escape. And this channel um, then fractured all of the ice and accidentally broke. And, washed out a couple of villages and a couple, well, well through, through a couple of towns and created quite some disaster in 1818. So they said with, with, with this that, um, year being a, a sort of anniversary to it, could I sort of make something that could um, uh, facilitate the recording of what Mother Nature is like in the mountains and the, the, the ferocious um, conditions it can be and and, and the speeds that all of these things like avalanches happen in. So I, I proposed um, a work that I call AeroCab. And AeroCab is, is basically uh, completely um, mech functionless. It doesn't have any um, mechanisms. It does have a, a very small 
a hydraulic power pack for the brakes, but apart from that, it's functionless. And we started making it this year, um, and here it resides on the installation of the mountain. That we this was the last thing that I installed, and I'm hoping in January to run tests. Um, and then in March to, to make the film, um, the, the work I'm very happy with. And I think the reason I'm happy with it is because I've broken away from this, um, I feel like weight on my shoulders of all of this research and all of this stuff I'd stand by to find something that is now an adventure. And with Aero Cab and Mud Skipper, I feel like, um, they're, they're works that will facilitate my journey in, in one way or another in life and also facilitate the journey of others who, um, who, who come to visit or collaborate like filmmakers and, and, and other artists within the, um, within, within the journeys and the projects. The, the last image I have is, um, is of the studio and it's, um, it's a small studio in South East London near Peckham. And I've been there for a good, well, since 2013, so a good couple of years now. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm content and happy continuing making work. But I feel that the works that I'm now coming into are, are the most exciting that I've made so far. Thanks. Thank you very, thanks very much to James. Um, do you want to do questions? We've got about 10 minutes if anyone has a question they'd like to ask. At the back. One at the back here. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, hello, it's uh, fascinating work. Um, I guess my question is about where the agency of the machines lie. Watching you manipulate um, Mountaineer across the metal yesterday, and also seeing the work Atlas that's biting away at its own plinth, requires a human agent to do that directing. You know, it's incredibly powerful machines, but you need a human in there to operate them. So I guess my question is, since they're sculptures and they're mechanized, where do you sit as the operator in that work? I mean, are you essential for the, for the works? Yeah, this, this is a, a, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I think, I think this question goes for, for a lot of things um, in society as well. Like, I, I think that there's more and more of a, 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 a lack of understanding of the the collaboration of, of human beings and um, machines or the mechanical things that inhabit the world with them that they collaborate with. Um, there's like an ongoing theory that AI is going to sort of slowly merge into these things and become, they're going to become autonomous and that um, we'll have, will eventually it'll become Terminator and we'll lose control of, of the, the things that we've built. But, from my perspective, I think that's a little um, story in, in, into, into, into that. And it's um, my collaborative effort with, with my sculptures, with my mobile sculptures or machines, is much like that of a musician. But I'm getting to the point where um, my knowledge and understanding and know-how of operation and maybe my analysis of operation isn't as good as um, my sort of knowledge of fabrication and, and construction. So um, I'm sort of very eager to work out a way that um, the uh, operation can be passed down chain to someone who would specifically, or a group of people who would specifically want to research into the operational ergonomics and so on of those, those things. But like there are certain things that that, that make, make sense to me, like the roof of a cabin, like on the boat or a greenhorn might be sort of like 
10 centimeters higher than the average cabin of a of a of a of a truck or a or a, a boat so because i'm quite tall and i quite like the space above my head so i do sort of like anticipate me being the operator in some cases um i've 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 let works like Treadtoe, I've, I've asked sort of telehandler operators in sculpture parks if they'd like a go and they, they just, because I think they're used to the operation of something like a telehandler, which is a good sort of seven ton machine, if you tip it over it's real, it can be fatal and they don't like the, 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 the feeling or, or even the knowledge that pulling a hydraulic lever slightly the wrong way could throw this whole thing over. Um, so factoring in the, 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 the sort of the, the different kinds of responsibility, the different kinds of operating uh, styles, it's, um, it, it, ends up being, it ends up being solely me who's operating them. But it doesn't have to be. But um, I suppose that then becomes the, 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 the thing that we see today that is changing the, the operating cab of, say, um, an agricultural tractor is being replaced with, well, it's just being minused off and replaced by a, a pellet, pellet case with um, some pretty clever software allowing it to, to go operator free. Um, and what that record or what that understanding of, of the human compatibility, the, the human decision making in the process of making art with machines like um, you can go to Carrara Marble Mine where Ai Weiwei gets a lot of his works made. And the funny, one of the funny things with Not Vital and Ai Weiwei is they'll, they'll now addition stone. Um, in the days of sculpture, if you wanted to make additions, you would go for bronze. But you can addition stone now because the robots can carve it in additions. And that's, that's quite an interesting phenomenon in art. And then it's like the sensibility to what your machines create in art. Is it, is it the hands of the operator? Is it the hands of the computer? Or are the artist's hands minus off because they're not allowed to use the, 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 the carving machine or whatever? So there's like loads of questions. And I suppose it keeps it quite pure. Um, in a way that it feels like a full circuit of evolution to be able to operate the things that you make. There are other interesting areas of operating the things you make in the sense that what's the legislation, you know? Like, it's, um, it's illegal for me to jump onto a telehandler and unload a truck as much as it's illegal for me to unload a truck with a Hayek crane. But if I have, um, if I have like a... 16 hydraulic cylinder, uh, 16 hydraulic lever system in a sculpture like Greenhorn that walks through a forest on flippers, then there's, there's absolutely no legislation for it. It's sort of like there's, it, you know, I can just jump in the cab and, and, and drive it to my heart's content. And there's like this, this amazing freedom to that. You know, the, the things that you make, you can then operate, and it, it's like, back in the days of the, the, the prototypers of aviation in a, in a funny way. I mean, and that's very exciting. The, the flying bathtub, you know, the, the film that we see on the YouTube, the most recent, like, phenomenal film of, of aviation and how aviation, the laws of aviation are completely changing right now with, um, with, with drones and with, with, with um, with uh, permanent magnet motors, you guys probably correct me on it, but uh, the, the, the laws are completely changing. You, you know, an aviation space frame had to be aerodynamic. You look at most drones and, and the way that they're held together with cable ties and you're like, what's aerodynamic about that? It's, um, it's really exciting. It's sort of like you could build a chassis, you could put these uh, motors on it and you can make practically anything fly and that that that's I've, I'm getting very excited about that that may be something that I pursue in the future um, I think that's uh, yeah, yeah sorry sorry to interrupt that's all we've got time for um, once again thank you very much to James Kaffer excellent thank you